Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 70 of Stir Crazy. I'm your host, Kim Brown. Today's episode, fascism in fatigues. Yes, Trump's federal agents being dispatched perhaps to a city near you, perhaps to your city. Uh, We have seen the sort of chaos and disorder that the federal agents from varying agencies, but pretty much mothering from Department of Homeland Security, uh, not doing much to to quell um, some of the uprising out there in Portland, Oregon, where people have been protesting mostly mostly peacefully um, until they get antagonized by some of these federal agents who are not identifying themselves near the federal courthouse in downtown Portland. We've got some footage of some of the action that's been going on out there with the the moms <laughs> and the dads now with leaf blowers as if there weren't already moms and dads in the streets for many, many weeks and years now. But it's okay. Like it sometimes it, it takes bad stuff happening to white people to really illuminate the problem, right? Like people are so freaked out what's going on in Portland. Well, this has been happening to black protesters for quite some time now. We'll get into that. Also, we're going to discuss the effects of COVID, right? COVID is out here beating the shit out of the United States for all intents and purposes. It's not a joke, but my God, this pandemic is pretty much out of control in a lot of states where we're seeing infections skyrocket. We are over 4 million infection, positive uh, COVID infections here in the U.S. with 140,000 dead in only five or s- months or so. This is horrible. And the Trump administration is doing a terrible job. But now uh, localities are trying to take steps into their own hands. Now mandating masks in some Republican states where we didn't think that that was going to happen. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, different places like that. We'll discuss that as well. Plus, we're going to talk about what's happening in Congress, uh, where a um, a couple of a, a pair of bills, one before the House, other before the Senate, both failed. Um, Republicans voted it down, but it at least was the first steps to try and to fund the military. They proposed 10 percent cuts to the overall military budget. As I said, didn't pass either chamber. And we will talk about which Democrats sided with the GOP and voted these measures down. But before we do that, time to introduce our fantastic panel joining us today. Uh, We are joined with our climate reporter here from The Real News, Aman Azar. Also our visuals and research producer, Andrew Corkery, and the director of Action Now Chicago. Joining us today, Deborah Harris. Panel, thank y'all so much for being here today. First. Pleasure. Let's get to it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to it. And, and, and Hey, everyone in the chat, I know we got started late. Don't, don't leave. Don't get mad. <laughs> uh, definitely drop us your comments, your questions, your concerns. We want to hear from you. If you're watching on Periscope via Twitter. Hello. Nice to see y'all as well. All right. Where we're going to start is Portland, Oregon, where again, the people have been taking to the streets by the thousands. I think Portland is well over 50 consecutive nights of nightly actions um, down by the federal courthouse. We have seen these fatigued agents. Again, don't know exactly what agencies they're from. Well, specifically, but we know that they come from ICE. They come from uh, Customs and Border Patrol, Department of Homeland Securities as the, the, the mothership, so to speak. Let's take a look at some of that footage, Dwayne. Let's look at some of the, 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 the protesting and the ongoing uh, clashes between these federal agents and protesters in Portland. <laughs> Fuck you. 
playing the Bill Withers in the background with a uh, lean on me as the dads were blowing uh, the leaf blowers to get the tear gas away. And yeah, they tear gas the shit out the moms out there in Portland. Um, Amon, I mean, what's interesting to me uh, about this, that I am glad that that this particular conflict between protesters and and these unnamed federal agents um, is getting the attention that that it should. Um, but what I'm glad, honestly, is that this was not happening in a in a mostly black place because I think the outcome would be a lot different. I think the police would probably a lot be a lot more heavy handed, and not to say that tear gassing um, peaceful protesters is is, is <laughs> light handed at all. But I think the racial dynamic between the cops and the protesters that largely they're the same, although there is a number of people of color who are leading these marches, but most of the attendees are in fact white. Um, what is your uh, observation about what's happening in Portland? Yeah, uh, you, you're right, Kim, but, but nonetheless, it's not as though there's not uh, systemic racism there. Of course it is, that's why you brought it up. Uh, so yes, just the fact that this wasn't entirely the case is actually a good thing. And at the same time, symptomatic of uh, all the racial divides that this particular administration is, is uh, kind of uh, playing on. And this is like a, a typical Donald Trump mafia style of governance. I mean, one thing which has uh, been happening, Kim, and, and some, somewhat in the commentary as well, that Donald Trump is no politician. It's not that being a politician would help the situation, but at least uh, career politicians are kind of trained in the manner of forging political alliances. But maybe uh, Mr. Trump has been very close to... Um, maybe Russian oligarchs or who knows who else, but his style of governance uh, now decidedly is very authoritarian. This is exactly what's going on. This is the executive option, executive arm of the government being uh, deployed to kind of uh, just grab people out and snatch people out of the streets and kind of uh, just get the political dynamics going, which the White House, White House is trying to do, which is, which is not a politics. This is like we said, it's it's a march, decided march to authoritarianism, and it's it's still it's it's a, it's a beginning. Uh, November is is still a few months away, Kim. Absolutely, Aman, you said a word there that Trump is not a politician. I definitely think he thinks he's Boss Hog uh, from the Dukes of Hazard. If you're a certain <laughs> age, you might remember uh, the Dukes of Hazard and uh, Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. You know that's probably Bill Barr, Andrew Corkery. Um, you know, th this is not a little deal where we have so-called secret police, um, you know, patrolling the streets of, of, of American cities. And nonetheless, these are agencies who are not necessarily trained in crowd control, but it doesn't necessarily seem they're actually there to control the crowd. They're there to uh, assault them with tear gas and, and pepper balls. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really kind of part of Trump's broader strategy in lieu of the election coming up. Uh, because basically he has not actually achieved anything for his voters. If you look at, you know, health care, I mean, he's gutted Obamacare. His voters don't have access to health care in a lot of rural uh, Republican areas. Uh, the wall has failed miserably. Uh, the economy is an absolute free fall uh, as because of the coronavirus pandemic and the unemployment that ensued from that. So, I mean, really his last gasp is to just gin up the fear machine and what better way to do that than to introduce the um you know gestapo style you know military and paramilitary groups that are unmarked and unnamed uh to sow chaos on the streets of america for people who are protesting against uh systemic racism and police killing of people of color so i mean it's, it's very endemic to trump to go to go to this length to try to pursue his political agenda because all of his other options have failed miserably. Deborah, you know, it seems as though what is happening in Portland could be coming to your town out there in Chicago, Illinois. Apparently there are 200 federal agents that have been authorized by the president from agencies like, uh, I think the FBI, uh, now I'm sorry. Now I'm drawing a blank there. I think there were two other agencies uh, named, but they involve, you know, Homeland Security. But according to your mayor, Lori Lightfoot, um, these agents won't be there in the same capacity as they are in Portland. And actually, we do have a report um, from a local Chicago affiliate that kind of explains the situation a little better. And then I want to get your reaction. Let's take a look at that. 
Trump says he's sending the federal agents to Chicago immediately. Here at City Hall, Mayor Lightfoot criticized the plan, even though those hundreds of federal agents are only supposed to investigate crimes. We will not stand by and watch it happen. Can't do that. The citizens of Chicago are citizens of America. A day after 15 people were shot at a funeral on the south side, President Trump says he's sending federal agents to Chicago to help. Americans must hold their city leaders accountable. They must insist that community officials fully support fully back and fully fund their local police departments. At the White House, President Trump welcomed the mother of 14-year-old Renato Jones, who died in a shooting in Inglewood on Independence Day. No mother should ever have to cradle her dead child in her arms simply because politicians refuse to do what is necessary. The president is trying to divert attention from his failed leadership on COVID-19. Mayor Lightfoot says there's a reason for all the violence in Chicago. There are too many damn guns on our streets. And why is that so? Because the Republican leadership for way too long, including this, this president, refuses to even have a conversation about common sense gun reform. The mayor says she won't allow federal agents to act like they have in Portland. That's what we call tyranny and dictatorship. And we are not having it in Chicago. Mayor Lightfoot says President Trump called her tonight to talk about the federal agents who will help investigate crimes. The mayor says if they do anything like Portland, she'll take legal action. Uh, that report from NBC Chicago News 5. Deborah, let me get your reaction to what is coming to the streets of Chicago. You know, I'm going to just be real with you. I'm literally sitting here sick to my stomach. Like, about to vomit <laughs> because there are, there are a couple different things happening here. You know, I, I hear this mayor speaking and I'm like, first of all, Chicago has a longstanding history of violence, CPD, of violence against communities of color, against black communities, of disappearing folks. You know, we're we're going through our own struggles with with regular protesting. Um, there being violence from CPD with people exercising their constitutional rights. Um, the fact that that clip that you showed um, where there was like a funeral that was shot up, like people warn CPD that there would be a shooting. And that you should be here and they did not send enough police to to monitor to to look into it to do any type of investigative detective work and then what happened the shooting happened and so i can point to a bunch of other situations where it's like if this mayor and um david brown actually wanted gun violence to stop they would actually do it they would actually take their job seriously but that is not the history of you know, our police department. And, and while they're busy, like calling out Donald Trump for being Donald Trump, for being a white supremacist, for doing what he wants to do and saying that, oh, if, if he, you know, allows, you know, these, you know, unmarked, unnamed people to come in town and they start, you know, messing with the protesters, we're going to have a legal suit. I'm just trying to figure out, like, how serious is that? Like, because not only are we battling you all with being able to peacefully assemble and protest systemic racism and the, you know, systemic violence, not just with gun violence, but economically, with housing displacement, with education, every single avenue that this local government has failed and is currently still failing us. It's like you have no room to call anyone else out on anything because you're not actually doing anything differently. And so for me, it's like it's it's really up to the people that are suffering the most from local violence, from federal violence to, to figure out this plan, because ain't nobody come to save us. Everyone has their own agenda um, about silencing black people, our grievances. People don't want to hear it and they hide behind, oh, we want to quell gun violence, and they hide behind, oh, we want to investigate to actually do what they've been wanting to do for a long time. The fact that the FOP, the president, went above the mayor and, and wrote the president, and we all know he is a living, breathing racist, to send folks here, it's like, what is that? 
this whole operation, like, what does that say to people? It's it's really like just just a bombshell of gaslighting and really finding any way to divert from what's really going on. And it's and it's everybody's doing the gaslighting, especially in Chicago. And I feel terrible for the residents of Chicago who who have to deal with uh, pockets of violence. Because let's be clear, I mean, the violence is not widespread across the city, but it is very much concentrated in areas that are black and brown and that begets state violence against those residents as well. And as much as this country seemed to be horrified at the thought of unidentified federal agents in the streets of Portland, Oregon, just disappearing protesters from off the streets, that has been happening in Chicago for a very, very long time. Andrew Corkery, I I know you checked out that piece a few years old now from the Chicago Tribune that did a a, a sort of detailed explanation about uh, the place called H- Horman Square. I hope I ha- have that right. Horman what, what, Square. What, yeah. Horman Square. Yeah. What was Chicago police doing, Andrew? Yeah. So I looked at that article and I also looked at another piece in the Guardian as well as a, a article in Mother Jones. And everyone can go check those out online after the show as well. I encourage everyone to look into this. But basically, police disappeared more than seven thousand people at an off-blocks interrogation warehouse in Chicago, nearly twice as many detentions as previously disclosed. This was according to what The Guardian revealed back in October of 2015. Now, Holman Hold on, Square, Andrew, 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 hold on, hold yeah, on. Run yeah. that number back one more time for the people. I want you to okay. you, say that number again and say it slowly. How yeah, many okay. people did Chicago <laughs> police disappear off the streets of Chicago? Say the yeah. number, bro. 7,000 people at Ann, which is one off books interrogation warehouse in Chicago that we know about. So, I mean, you know, let's be clear about that. That's, that's what we know about right now. But Holman Square was this secretive facility that the Chicago police had previously described as little more than a low-level narcotics crime outpost, where the mayor, former mayor Rahm Emanuel, had said that the police, quote, follow all the rules, end quote. <laughs> In turn, uh, in ter- it turns out that actually uh, of the 7,185 people detained since 2004, the Guardian noted in 2015 that just 68 had access to a lawyer or were able to make their whereabouts known to a family or friend, uh, and about 65% of uh, the detentions took place after May 16th, 2011, when Emmanuel took office. So those cases were traceable only because the interrogations resulted in an arrest. Um, And nobody knows how many more people were detained for a time and then released. Homan Square keeps no booking records, according to a sworn deposition of a police researcher that was quoted by The Guardian in 2015. Um, So this is just an absolute cacophonous nightmare of fascist proportions. I mean, it's... You know, to, to say that Portland is the beginning and end point of what's happening in America right now is to live in a state of complete lackadaisical, you know, uh, amnesia about what our historical racist past has to tell about what we're dealing with today. Exactly. And, and Deborah, I do want you to hop back in here, hon, because I, I know you have some perspective um, on this, considering it was happening in your city. But everyone that is watching, just just be clear. Every fucked up thing that this government tries to do to the American citizens, they tried it on black and indigenous people first. Okay. And, 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 and perfected it (laughs) and they worked on it and they massaged it. And then they gave it a system upgrade. Like everything that violates constitutional rights has been done to people of color in this nation. They tested on us to see if they can do it on white folks. And this is exactly what you're seeing in Portland. So please, if you are horrified what's happening in Portland and the thought and possibility that these federal agents could come to your city and just disappear people off the streets, they have been doing it to black people for a very long time. Deborah, hop in here, hon. I mean, you said it, um, brother Andrew, you said it. Like, I I think, you know, it's like, we've come to a 
Like we're at the point where it's like, if you don't want to swallow the truth, then baby, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I'm not about to sugarcoat, walk around what the truth actually is. I'm not about to be purposefully gaslit. I'm, I'm not about any of this trash. Like it is what it is. You're a part of the system that's trying to erase black people literally physically with our with our words, our fight for human dignity, you know, our fight for our civil rights. You are a part of the problem. I don't care what color you are. Um, you are upholding these systems. You're allowing these things to happen to make sure we we don't go anywhere as black people in, in this country. And it's just like, you know, and like he said, like if if you're gonna pretend like what's happening in Portland is like the beginning, and like you said also, sis, like this has been happening. This is America. I'm tired of people in chat groups and saying this is not America. Baby, <laughs> stop. Cut it out. Like ain't, ain't nobody got time like today. We're we're done with with trying to whitewash and pretend and erase no. This is America. What we're trying to do is create a new thing. <laughs> you know, and that is coming with literally over centuries lives being constantly lost and taken out because we dare to fight, um, to be seen, to be respected, to, to breathe, to breathe. So even as we talk about right now, you know, with how people are showing up, we'll say white people are showing up. In, um, in this moment, these uprisings, like even with like all the moms groups and dads groups that are popping up and they're getting all of this like praise and media. It's just like, we've been out there since day one. <laughs> but the media in this country is constantly trying to erase our validity and our mm -hmm. voice and our say and our human dignity in any respect that, you know, you're, you're rewriting history every five minutes. You know, um, and so that's why I think it's important even today as we're seeing, you know, the president of these United States and the mayor of this city and um, um, David Brown, like go back and forth, like what isn't going to happen and what they need to see happen in Chicago. And we aren't going to let this stand the third. You already have let this stand the third happen with your eyes wide open. You're part of the problem. So it's like. What are we doing here? That's why I say like we're we only got us like that's it. Like I don't I don't trust it. And like the way we have to move politically, you know, with educating people and empowering people like it's about protecting us now. It's about moving out them people that skin folk, but ain't necessarily kin folk. It's about, you know, teaching people that like, yo, don't let these this history gaslight you into believing that this is new, that that you don't deserve a say and a place on this map and your right to life. And it's like I said, it's it's sickening. It's sickening. It turns my stomach to know that we are here and we are still here yet again. I would have never thought in a million years that I'd be a 37 year old woman going through this. And fighting yes. like this. And, and, and the fight, you know, it, it's it's the same fight, right? Just we just wearing different clothes, right? It's just it's just a different era. Um, and it's it's a lifetime of it's a lifetime struggle. I had an activist, a Haitian activist, tell me that once. Like it, it this is a lifetime struggle. And it's really putting really the foundation of this country, what this country claims to be based on, uh, you know, separation of powers between, uh, you know, the judiciary and the legislator and the executive, and then, you know, the law enforcement angle of, of all of this. And Aman, I, I think what is setting up here is the potential for, um, you know, the, the armed part of the state, the, the, the armed state versus the elected state. And what I mean by that is, you know, you hear Chicago mayor Lori Lightfoot talk really tough about if, um, Trump has these, these agents come in, you know, she's not here if they're going to violate Chicagoans civil rights, et cetera. And the district attorney for the city of Philadelphia, his name is Larry Krasner. He was on democracy now today um, with Amy Goodman. And this is what he had to say about the president saying that these agents could be coming to the city of Philadelphia and what he'd be willing to do to counteract that. Let's take a look at that. It's real simple. The law applies to the president of the United States, even though he doesn't think so. The law applies to law enforcement. The law applies to civilians. I mean, it is real simple. We have to be even handed. So if people are going to come to Philadelphia and in uniform, they're going to fracture the skulls 
of protesters with rubber bullets. They're going to jump out of rental vans and drag people into those vans without probable cause. They are committing crimes under the Pennsylvania statutes. These are Pennsylvania offenses over which the district attorney in Philly has jurisdiction over that area. And we can bring those charges. The law is very clear. Uh, we can proceed with those charges in state court. Under certain circumstances, they might end up being processed in federal court. But initially, we can bring those charges. We can pursue them. And as much as possible, we can put those individuals in front of a Philadelphia jury who might have something to say about those tactics. Now, Aman, all that sounds so nice and good. I think the DA is a little naive there if he thinks that police are about to go and arrest other police, right? Like the thin blue wall or the thin blue line in that big blue wall, whatever, whatever the phrase is uh, that, that cops use to stick together is basically what it means, that all law enforcement will stick together. And, you know, we saw something similar here in Baltimore during the whole Freddie Gray trial where the district attorney or state's attorney, rather, Marilyn Mosby, was not able to get warrants executed to, to gather evidence needed to make her case. And consequently, the cases fell apart. Nobody was charged or, or rather no one was convicted in the, in the murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore. But it's, it's almost a similar thing. Like, how was the what police is he going to send to go arrest the other police? They're going to run facial recognition on these police? Like, I, what, what are your thoughts about district attorneys and, and mayors saying that they will, in fact, arrest federal agents if they come into these cities and violate people's civil rights? Well, what it, what it does say, Kim, is that this, in, in an event like that, would only lead to a kind of a constitutional crisis with which would actually add to the whole list of crises that we're already trying to deal with without any kind of a leadership from any quarter at all. That's, that's what it means at one level. So let's, let's get something clear. What is exactly the point of law and order exactly? Uh, the, from, what, from what I read was that there should be actually a kind of a safe environment for people to go out and express their political dissent that's what law and order is supposed to provide, a safe space for people to assemble and exercise their right to dissent and defer on issues that govern their life on a daily basis. But no, sir, what you're seeing right now and for a while now, this march of tyranny continues to go on. And, we, and, and you said that right, actually, this art has been perfected uh, by creating this uh, kind of a uh, this deadly nexus uh, over many generations of, of uh, poverty and racial inequalities. And, and then you kind of have a, a whole list of uh, people, disenfranchised people that you can kind of just throw in, into jails and then just lock them up. And then they have no representation whatsoever. So this art has really been perfected. And now you've, you've seen that uh, being filmed and then broadcasted on, on public airways. So this is really what it is. What is sad on top of it is, that this is exactly the time when the pandemic is literally surging across the globe. And of course, um, we used to be the probably leader in, in other affairs, but right now we're we actually leaders in, in showcasing the kind of coronavirus cases and the deaths which uh, we are incurring just because the White House not only has no game plan, but the president is only into bullying. And, and that's apparently the only playbook that's available to him to kind of showcase that uh, he's, he's somebody in charge when clearly he's not. And if, if somebody thinks uh, back in, 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 in his quarry that this kind of uh, um, violence and uh, kind of shoving people would actually work, people would be afraid, then I think uh, they, this is a gross kind of a mistake, a political, costly political mistake that they're going to make because uh, people are already biting, are being bitten by so many other things at the same time. People are losing jobs every day. And if he thinks that this can be done to people and then people will be afraid and this will play as a political gimmick, this is not going to work. Absolutely. Guys, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys can hear that. That's my dog dreaming behind me. So if you're a dog barking, that, that's what that is. Hey, from the comments, TV Puerto Vallarta says the government or the governor rather should call out the national guard to arrest DHS. If they kidnap people and shoot tear gas, Andrew Corkery, uh, this is your, your neck in the woods here, Larry Krasner, um, talking, talking kind of tough, but, I, I, I don't know if I believe him. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. What, what, what is your take on, on his stance, uh, about, about this? 
Yeah, I mean, to, to Aman's point, I mean, if you look at the local politics of just Philadelphia, and I'm from the area, and I'm currently, you know, about 25 minutes from Philadelphia where I'm doing this, uh, you know, show from. But uh, basically, you know, John McNesby, the head of the, uh, the FOP in Philadelphia, the police union, um, absolutely loathes Larry Krasner. He thinks he is the worst thing to happen to the city of Philadelphia in probably a generation. So to think that, you know, uh, Larry Krasner is going to motivate these police officers who are orchestrated in terms of their narrative and where they're at politically by the police union of Philadelphia, which is squarely against every single thing that Larry Krasner tries to do in the city to advance civil rights, to advance, you know, the rights of people of color, color to hold police officers accountable, to think that that same fascistic, you know, police department that has such a storied history in Philadelphia of suppressing people of color. I mean, we're like the only city in the country to actually actively bomb, you know, communities of color in this in the 70s and the 80s with the move bombing. So I mean, to think that this structure is going to take place and to stop these federal agents is incredibly naive to, to Amon's point. But I also think that it's part of Trump's broader strategy to actually trigger a constitutional crisis. Because if there is no crisis, then there's no reason for him to be kept in office. Because if he gets his base to realize or to think that there's a crisis, they will support him just as much as they already have. But at the same time, the people who are kind of still on the edges, which is you know amazing to think that all this stuff can happen. There's people that are still undecided. But there are some people out there that are like that, that, you know, they'll go into the booth and they'll decide and they won't tell people what exactly they're doing and they're not politically engaged and that sort of a thing. Those people will ultimately decide the election in the swing states. And so if they buy into Trump's fear narrative and they just don't show up, you know, and not vote for Biden, um, Trump will get in again. So, I mean, this is part of his strategic play. Now, whether or not that's actually going to happen or not remains to be seen. But it's part of his overarching narrative about how to manipulate the electoral and political system in America for his own uh, political gain. Absolutely. And, you know, Donald Trump is trying to paint uh, the presumptive Democratic nominee for president as someone who is part of the radical left and uh, claiming that Joe Biden supports defunding the police. Joe Biden does not <laughs> support defunding the police. Um, and Joe Biden more than likely does not support defunding the military. However, there were a pair of proposals uh, on the Hill this week, one in the House, one in the Senate, that made that exact proposal. Um, I, I think this was part of the, the NDAA reauthorization. I need to double check that. I should have did that before I came on, on the air today. Howsomever, uh, the, the, the story is that neither of these proposals passed. And I, I want us to pop up uh, a couple of tweets because what happened in the House was Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, she proposed an amendment um, to this particular bill that would have ended the war in, e in Afghanistan, rather, I, I think by middle of next year. And it would have called for the removal of, of all troops um, from Afghanistan. And that was defeated. Um, and a number of notable Democrats said no <laughs> to this exact thing. Keep that up there for a second, Dwayne, because I, I want to, I got to find this on my phone so I can read it aloud because um, there are uh, just um, people that normally come, um, as the you know tweet talked about, uh, people that are asking for like progressive endorsements when it's election time. But when they get into Congress, uh, this is exactly how they vote. And um, mind you, Ilhan Omar again is in the House, and the Democrats hold a majority in the House. So you know, folks. There's no question here that there are not one but two parties that support um, tremendous funding for the military. And again, this is about ending the war in Afghanistan, which has been raging for almost 20 years. 20 years. I'm 41. 
<laughs> okay? Half my life, uh, the United States has been in Afghanistan. But let's see, Pete Aguilar voted no. Who are some other notable folks in here? John Byer, um, re representing Virginia's uh, 8th District. G.K. Butterfield, uh, he is one of the main members of the Congressional Black Caucus representing North Carolina's 1st District. Um, yeah, Jim Clyburn, South Carolina, I mean, Lord have mercy. We have so many defenders of this bloated military budget to the detriment of social programs and unemployment at this particular moment for Americans, 40 some million Americans, the unemployment rates is over 11%. Steady Hoyer, uh, the majority whip of the house, uh, top Democrat in the House after after Nancy Pelosi. My goodness. So yes, Lucy McBath also uh, representing Georgia's sixth district. She is a um, new congresswoman. We know her from um, her son, Jordan Davis, uh, was shot and killed in in um, Florida, and she has been elected to the House. Uh, Mike Bloomberg was someone that she endorsed for president, just to give you an idea of her politics, um, absent of her the tragic circumstances that happened to her family. Uh, but gang, you know. What gives here? Let's talk about this House vote for a second. Um, Democrats hold the majority, as I said, and still, you know, ending the war in Afghanistan is a bridge too far uh, for the Democratic Party, Deborah. Uh, this gives us an indication that, you know, should Joe Biden actually be elected to the White House, it's pretty much going to be status quo for the United States remaining the world cop and trying to meddle and interfere in in places far, far away from home uh, that are not a, a challenging or threatening us at this point in time. What, what, what is your take about what happened there for this vote? We have an obsession with killing people. We have an obsession with, you know, pretending to be the good guy, but being, you know, tyrants in our own way. We have an obsession with control, you know, and it's, it's the American way. So it's this generation and generations before us, like that's why these fights are so important because we are literally trying to get to a new place where, where human life is, 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 is just valued, where we are not trying to rule over people with violence after violence after violence after violence. Um, and it is disheartening. Um, to, to see those Democrats, you know, that are still in this space of, you know, just capitalism and, you know, control and power versus like, how do we save people? How do we give people their rights back? How do we promote transformational living and peace? Like, you know, it's like, there's, there's still this, this, colonial, white supremacist, patriarchal, just mindset that does not play friendly with peace. You know, this, that can't reimagine anything outside of terror. You know, and it and it just makes me question, like, you know, there are children and, and families, like, that we're just, like, picking off and killing because of what? Like, why are we still over there? But then also it's a reflection on our country, too. Like, why is this country still hell bent on doing what they do with our military, with, you know, our police unions, X, Y, Z. So, you know, I think even with, as we talk about like Democrat versus Republican, and, you know, we just have to reimagine everything and work toward just wiping the slate clean and approaching this republic and democracy just in a brand new way. And that's what we're fighting for. That's what people are have given their lives for. That's what we're still giving our lives for, the right mm. to do just that. Aman, um, one of the women who is reported to be on Joe Biden's shortlist for uh, vice president, Congresswoman Val Demings also um, opposed this. Again, you know, just to give y'all an idea as to, um, who are the Democrats that that are not interested in ending the war in Afghanistan? But for God's sakes, I'm on 19 years um, yeah. is, a, is a long time to be actually, anywhere. Right. Actually, uh, may I remind you, it's it's been over 44 years uh, when uh, it, it, let, let's put it this way. When 
uh, the political elected political government in Pakistan was ousted. That was 1977. That was the time when the military took over and forced an alliance with the United States to fight off the Soviets in Afghanistan. That's where it goes. That's where it goes back. And that poor country has, has paid the price very heavily. So it's been 44 years that this has been going on. So 20 years until the Soviet Union was defeated. And then after that, that, of course, uh, the United States kind of packed up and went. And then what happened was that the the Mujahideen became Taliban and it was their government. What happened to that country in that era, everybody knows. And this is a resurgence. The problem is that we have gotten ourselves embroiled so heavily into mm. different countries that now even withdrawal would mean an utter disaster. And that is the problem because as soon as United States, because otherwise the Obama presidency has been trying very hard to do this. Why they can't is because there is just no viable alternative otherwise for that state to continue with itself by itself. It just cannot because it, because there are forces around that country who will literally tear it apart to kind of uh, uh, kind of secure its own interests. So that is a very huge problem. I'm afraid, Kim, just getting out of Afghanistan will literally not solve anything also. But, but this is for another time. Also, uh, for, this, for this bill and the way it's voted, well, the, why matters are at the point in, in this point in time the way they are is because the Democrats and Republicans have been taking turns to screw people up. This is what it tells you. This is what mostly even people in the Democrat Democratic camp sign on to as soon as they come on to, to the legislative powers. This is what they sign on to, that they will keep the status quo and the march of the empire going. This is what it tells you. So I absolutely favor uh, the point um, uh, made by my sister that this state has, slate has to be wiped clean and we have to start over. And this... this uh, this entire state needs to reimagine and reinvent itself as a protector of the citizens who are the actual benefactors, and which is theoretically where the power flows from. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, go ahead, Andrew, because I, I did want to just move along, but we could. It's it's still related in terms of um, the vote that happened in the Senate, where um, Bernie Sanders' proposal to cut their Pentagon budget by 10% and invest the money in jobs, education, healthcare, and housing uh, was soundly defeated. But um, uh, a number of people, including potential vice president um, appointee or so, you know, selectee, Senator Kamala Harris, uh, voted with the GOP to not defund the military at all. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, so I, I'm really glad that you actually showed that, though, Kim, because it's it's indicative of one of the most important points I think that uh, Martin Luther King in his time alive addressed, which is that any country that continues to spend more money on military defense than programs of social uplift is approaching a spiritual death. And that's what we've been seeing for, you know, since Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex and probably even before that. And you're just seeing it accelerate because there are private interests invested, there are government interests, and there's a whole apparatus of people making money on an industry that is totally reliant on death, and particularly death of people of color and marginalized groups and the global south the world over. So, I mean, this, this is part of an overarching economic issue as well as it is a political issue. And they're both intertwined directly because of the fact that the, these industries and people like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and all these military contractors make such an enormous, obscene amount of money on proliferating these weapons around the world so that they can do whatever they want within the economic system of capitalism that the United States has provided to them. But the result is innumerable amount of suffering for people of the global south and people the world over. And until we address that core issue in which the economy is actually fundamentally organized around creating a benefit for killing individuals all over the world, you're not going to be able to deal with the crux of the problem. 
Linda G in the comments says corporate Democrats are, are they really any better? No, they aren't. <laughs> Matt kiss my ass. Socialist says, where do you think <laughs> the politicians millions come from? Yes. Without, without a doubt. Yes. It, it comes from all these defense spenders and, 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 and yeah, like you said, Andrew, you know, Raytheon, Boeing, you know, the, the, these are the, the big dollars. This is actually who really runs America. Uh, Joe Smith says the politicians got to keep that human war machine cranking with all their war toys to play with. Yeah. But, um, but uh, hopefully we are entering a different era because, you know, like everyone on this panel has said, there's not much distinction between Republican and Democrat uh, on this issue in particular when it comes to military and defense spending. Guys, we're really out of time. And it is very important to me that we hit this next story because um, it, it, it says a lot about where we are in 2020 how far women, especially women of color, have come uh, when they get into the halls of power. And I'm speaking about Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Earlier this week, um, as overheard by a reporter, I think it was a reporter from The Hill, um, she was standing on the steps of, of, of the Capitol and she was accosted by one of her colleagues, Congressman Ted Yoho from Florida, um, where he allegedly called her, like berated her, and then he called her a fucking bitch, right? As he's like walking away. Now, Alexandra's from the Bronx. So, I, you know, you thought she would have handled it, handled it, but she did handle it. She handled it with grace and class. These, these, these attributes that, you know, are, are lauded upon women when they don't lose their mind and flip out and cuss people out, which is great. Um, let, let's hear from Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez. This was today on the House floor. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Let's not do that first, Dwayne. Actually, let's hear from Ted Yoho because he got a lot of pushback from, from his berating of um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And so he gave some bullshit apology on the House floor and then she responded. So let's hear from Ted Yoho first. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you this morning to address the strife I injected into the already contentious Congress. I have worked with many members in this chamber over the past four terms, members on both sides of the aisle, and each of you know that I'm a man of my word. So let me take a moment to address this body. I rise to apologize for the abrupt manner of the conversation I had with my colleague from New York. It is true that we disagree on policies and visions for America, but that does not mean we should be disrespectful. Having been married for 45 years with two daughters, I'm very cognizant of my language. The offensive name calling uh, words attributed to me by the press were never spoken to my colleagues, and if they were construed that way, I apologize for their misunderstanding. As my colleagues know, I'm passionate about those affected by poverty. My wife Carolyn and I started out together at the age of 19 with nothing. We did odd jobs, and we were on food stamps. I know the face of poverty, and for a time it was mine. That is why I know people in this country can still, with all its faults, rise up and succeed and not be encouraged to break the law. I will commit to each of you that I will conduct myself from a place of passion and understanding that policy and political disagreement be vigorously debated with the knowledge that we approach the problems facing our nation with the betterment of the country in mind and the people we serve. I cannot apologize for my passion or for loving my God, my family, and my country. I yield back. Representative Yoho put his finger in my face. He called me disgusting. He called me crazy. He called me out of my mind. Um, and he called me dangerous. I took a few steps ahead and I walked inside and cast my vote. Um, because my constituents send me here each and every day to fight for them and to make sure that they are able to keep a roof over their head, that they're able to feed their families, and that they're able to carry their lives with dignity. I walked back out and there were reporters in the front of the Capitol and in front of reporters, Representative Yoho called me, and I quote, a fucking bitch. These are the words that Representative Yoho levied against a congresswoman 
the congresswoman that not only represents New York's 14th congressional district, but every congresswoman and every woman in this country. Because all of us have had to deal with this in some form, some way, some shape, at some point in our lives. And this kind of language is not new. I have encountered words uttered by Mr. Yoho and men uttering the same words as Mr. Yoho while I was being harassed in restaurants. I have tossed men out of bars that have used language like Mr. Yoho's. And I have encountered this type of harassment riding the subway in New York City. Mr. Yoho was not alone. He was walking shoulder to shoulder with Representative Roger Williams. And that's when we start to see that this issue is not about one incident. It is cultural. It is a culture of lack of impunity, of accepting of violence and violent language against women, and an entire structure of power that supports that. Because not only have I been spoken to disrespectfully, particularly by members of the Republican Party and elected officials in the Republican Party, not just here, but the President of the United States last year told me to go home to another country with the implication that I don't even belong in America. The governor of Florida, Governor DeSantis, before I even was sworn in, called me a whatever that is. Dehumanizing language is not new. And what we are seeing is that incidents like these are happening in a pattern. This is a pattern of, of an attitude towards women and dehumanization of others. You better talk about it. Powerful, right there. For the people who sometimes ask me, Kim, why don't you run for Congress? I can't run for Congress because I'm not that classy, y'all. I can't. I'd have been like, Tell Yoho to get his ass out here. I got some words for him. Um, Deborah, first of all, like you said, she she handled that brilliantly. But the fact that, you know, misogyny is still a major problem <laughs> in this country um, and definitely in, in, in places of power where there are few women and then even fewer women of color. And uh, something that Ted Yoho said in, in his I can't even call that an apology because he he didn't really say I'm sorry. He even denied saying what he said. Um, but he talked about how his wife and then he has two daughters. And that to me is a classic cop out for misogynistic men um, when they are caught being verbally abusive or abusive period to women is like, well, I have daughters. Well, just because you're a father to a daughter doesn't mean that you're not a piece of shit. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're a, you're a good father to your daughters. doesn't mean that you're a good husband. Uh, you could be verbally abusive to your wife and daughters as well. Just being a father or a husband does not make you um, a, a girl dad, right? To, to coin a, a recent trendy phrase. What is your take about that whole exchange uh, between Ted Yoho and how uh, uh, AOC was able to compose herself and handle herself like a G? You know, she did, you know, she spoke on it and and she was very clear about what it was and what it wasn't. And she wasn't falling for the okie doke and she called everybody out, even his little crony that was with him. <laughs> um, you know, and the thing is, 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 you know, I'm wondering what that would have looked like had it been Ayanna Presley, you know, um, and not only is are women met with violence? Are we met with violence at every turn? You know, um, you know, black women, the amount of violence, killing, erasure, kidnapping, indigenous women. And it's just like, yes, it is a culture that this country was built on. And the fact that, you know, which is why I understand her, like not, I don't want your apology. That wasn't even an apology. I don't even know what that was. That was you. Um, standing up for your whiteness and your maleness and saying, you know, like you just said, just because you're a father, you know, of two girls and you happen to be married to a woman, then that excuses what you did or your behavior. And somehow because you mentioned God, that that excuses what happened. 
and your behavior. Um, you know, it's just like these are the, the, the warfare that we go through um, as black women, as women of color to be respected, to be uplifted, upheld, be heard. Um, and it's, it's from the top down. Is what this nation was built upon. And, you know, I wouldn't have thought twice if she had a hauled off her shoe and slung it across his head, <laughs> you know, and it's just like this, this new generation of leaders, um, elected officials, like they're the ones that are like raising a new standard, you know, to what it is. They're the ones that are helping wipe this slate clean. Like, I'm not going to be silent about this. Like, if you come for me, I come for you. And not only am I coming for you, but my whole block might be coming for you too. So watch out. <laughs> So, <laughs> Andrew, um, the fact that Ted Yoho got up there and said, but I won't apologize from a passion. I was passionate. That's why I called her a fucking bitch, because I was feeling passionate. I mean, come on, bruh. Do better. What, what are you what are your thoughts about uh, about that? That that moment, um, him and her. Uh, but obviously. Like just just the entitlement. Like he knows he called her that name. He knows he said it, and then he's going to get on the floor and say, "Well, if you thought I said that, my bad." But anyway, my daughters are waiting for me. Anyway, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing, just like AOC and everyone here, like outlined, is that you know um, it's part of a broader systemic issue, and until it's dealt with as such, it won't be dealt with. And so the problem is, is that. Um, the media is inherently biased towards sensationalism and conflict. And so what they see in this story is a politically charged um, sensationalist story uh, about two members of two opposing parties, conceivably ideologically way different, uh, going at it, and that gets ratings. So I think the problem that we need to look out for in addition to the main problem, which is what AOC is outlining, the enhanced misogyny in this culture that is just running rampant everywhere um, and how to deal with that. The problem is also the way that the media characterizes the situation while not dealing with the root causes that have led to a situation where Representative Yoho can say that to a woman of color who's a congresswoman and conceivably get away with it in the context of the media. And so I think we need to look out for how the media frames this as a political fight, when in reality, like we're talking about here, it is a much more endemic conversation to, brut to brutalization of women and dehumanization of women and people of color in this country that is enacted both through rhetoric and policy as well. And so if we don't deal with that concept and we just let the media take the narrative, which is try to be as sensationalist as, as possible and get as many ratings and don't talk about the substance of what the real issue is, we're gonna be in a problem as well. Absolutely, uh, Aman, go ahead and hop in yeah. here because again, this is more than just a, a, as Andrew pointed out rightly, that this is not just a personal conflict here. This is a power no. dynamic and AOC and Ted Yoho walk in the same door and have the same title um, as representatives in, in uh, our, our house chamber. Uh, Kim, um, yeah, and, and frankly, uh, Ted Joho was like symptomatic of the same dehumanizing voice and culture, which you see out there shoving people and disappearing them on the street. That's the kind of a disrespect with otherwise these forces are showing to people of color. This is the same brutalizing, dehumanizing culture, which is manifested in how Ted Joho uh, behaved. And of course, he said it out loud and yeah, I'm not gonna, I can do it and I'm not gonna apologize. This is what it is. This is exactly what the fight is against. This is the face and people and the culture and the mindset that we are dealing with. And that is why it is important to get as many diverse voices within politics and everywhere that we can so that this kind of a misogynist culture can be stemmed in its roots and put it in its place. Without question from the comments, Spot Check News says she handled it presidentially as fuck. Not bad for a bartender to all you haters. And who else? Linda G says reclaiming the word bitch. Well, she's already done that, actually. Let's take a look at uh, AOC's TikTok that she put up um, after this incident. <laughs> I'm 
a boss. I'm a bitch and a boss. I'm a shine like glass. I'm a bitch. I'm a boss. Play it again. It's only eight seconds. <laughs> it's really cute. I'm a bitch. I'm a boss. I'm a bitch and a boss. I'm a shine like glass. I'm a bitch. I'm a boss. Yeah, you know, hey, she's letting y'all know. Okay. I am a bitch, but you don't get to call me a bitch. <laughs> so let's let's just get that straight. Hey guys, okay, it's she it's is way the queen of the clapback <laughs> for sure. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, she she just going after everybody on Twitter, dunking on them, doing everything, you know. But she <laughs> she representing with the policies though. See, that's the thing. It's not a just it's not an entirely a distraction mechanism. It's it's part of a broader policy prescription, and you know, she just does that kind of to put people in line. That's right. And she's apparently leading a progressive wave coming out of New York City and New York State, uh, getting a lot of these old establishment Democrats up out of the paint and uh, make a way some, for, for some progressives and some people that's actually going to say something real um, and, and, and mean it and believe in what they stand for. But guys, uh, that is our time for Stir Crazy. I'd like to thank our panel today, Amon Azar, Andrew Corkery, Deborah Harris. Action Now Chicago. You guys check out what Deborah's doing out there in Chicago. There is a lot happening. Um, Thank you guys. Appreciate y'all y'all stopping by. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having yeah, us. Yeah, thanks great, for having me. Great time. And don't forget tonight, guys, is a brand new episode of Police Accountability Report with Steve and Janice and hosted by Taya Graham. Um, they are keeping their finger on the pulse uh, and investigating different stories that are happening across the country as it relates to police brutality and um, trying to hold police accountable. So definitely tune in to the police accountability report tonight. And don't forget tomorrow, stir crazy. It is once again, First Nation Fridays, where we have our crew of indigenous ladies. We all go hard. Uh, Desiree Kane, Johnny J, Jen Deer and Water. We're going to check in with all the issues that are happening across Indian country. Indian country has been popping in uh, this whole month. There's been a lot going on uh, with our Native brothers and sisters, so we will get into all that tomorrow. First Nation Fridays right here on Stir Crazy Gang. I'm Kim Brown. That's the time. See y'all tomorrow. Have a good rest of your evening. See you. Bye.